Okay, is that coming out? Right. Shall I? Right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you to Anthony for this function room as well. And, and thank you to Susanna, who we are celebrating today with her amazing books come out. Um, I'm not sure I'm supposed to say words, but I've got them, so I'm going to say them. And uh, I'm going to read a, a passage with a bit of sex in it which is really because this whole book is libidinous, like from head to toe. But I wanted to use it, just a short example of the narrative voice. I want to say something general about this book because so, so much happens in this book. Um, so it's a narrative voice which I think holds together all these overflowing ideas in, in a quite unexpected way. Now, a few years ago, I pretended to be Susanna's agent after I'd read this book. And I spoke for over an hour with somebody at Canongate who'd also read it, trying to persuade them to publish this impeccably postmodern novel thing. Anyway, it didn't go. And when I reread it, like for this, it occurred to me that maybe it is the narrative voice that they balked at. Because actually, it's a sort of innocent, naughty, chick lit voice in which. We hear, we see the, the narrator, the heroine, Nina. She's, uh, she's, she's searching and stumbling, and she has adventures, and she grows wise, and she ends up with this you know, outrageously perfect bloke. And that's the end. But actually, it, it, it completely transforms and renovates the genre of chick lit, for want of a better word, like other popular genres have been. And it turns it, in this case, into a fantastical novel of low culture, of fetishes and substitutes and counterfeits and kitsch, and how genuine these things are. So, you know, following that convention, there's a very straightforward voice without, it's like first degree, there's no doubleness, there are no coded messages, and you don't get the author sort of winking and pointing from behind the character at you, the reader. It's a uh, it's the, the complexity, you know, this mesh of events and ideas is very complex, but it's completely openly laid out by Nina herself. She, she always tells you if something could be a trick. She, um, she, she, she works out all her speculations on the page. And she's actually a totally reliable narrator, which is probably a no-no for Canongate. And the other thing is not, it's not one of these sort of colloquial tour de force narrative voices that, in fact, are very tiresomely uh, artificial and, uh, and, and contrived and self-conscious. And it's not an exactly literary voice either in the sense of, of, of high-flown or elaborate or could only exist on the page. You feel that it's Nina speaking to you from inside her own kind of weird, stubborn, humorous head. And the way she advances the story, with a, it's kind of tumbles of casual aphorisms, chatty descriptions, you know, earnest puzzlings over things, I think is a tremendous technical tour de force and a real pleasure. Because uh, for once, the reader is not invited to complete the work, as they say in the modern art world. It's all here for you to play with. So this, just this little piece, it is not a bravura piece like, like many in here, it's just a bit of narration that I think 
you know, it shows a bit what I was talking about. Um, he, here she is with the great cartoon characters, really, of the collector, his wife, and his assistant, who claim to be making a museum of film memorabilia. And Nina's mother, who's also called Nina, was a foot extra for Buñuel, and they want to buy her shoes. So, Before we went for dinner, I gave them Nina Chavelli's shoes, a dull black pair of plain high heels with a double strap. The collector gave me the check, told me to spend it wisely with a smirk which I recognized as his trademark. I couldn't conceal my euphoria, but then felt sadness as well, an absurd feeling that I was selling my mother, stealing from my father. The collector didn't mention the introduction to Le Cour he had offered me. That's the famous French philosopher she ends up ghostwriting for. <laughs> it was just bait, I thought. And I understood that I was supposed to forget about it. If there was something attractive about the collector, it was the charlatan in him. We had dinner in a Japanese restaurant, drank warm sake as if it was tea. It was the first time that I ate sushi. I didn't like fish at the time. I wasn't sure about the nori's rubbery texture. I nibbled it while my gaze went into soft focus mode over Zachary's seductive features. He was now talking for the first time. He had a perfectly sensual mouth through which he muttered words in English with a husky French accent. He said that high heels were a symbol of female sexuality and that there was no equivalent for male sexuality. Wasn't that interesting? Wasn't that interesting? <laughs> There wasn't any object close to the male body that signaled his sexuality. A gun? He didn't like the idea of a gun. It sing signaled male aggression, not virility. A pipe was the only thing he could think of. But how did a pipe compare with the sexual impact of a high heel as a symbol? Then he said that he was supposed to come to London soon and ask me for my number with an odd gesture where his tongue hung on his lips in mid-sentence. It was an utterly out of place gesture, sort of sexy and disgusting at once. I had never come across such a gesture before, nor afterwards. As I gave him my number, the collector's coughs interrupted my erotic reverie. He had a coughing attack. He pointed to the wasabi. Kathy tapped him on the back, said he was coughing a lot of late. Then she talked about Chiapas, the uprisings, the death on both sides. Some say 150, some 500, she said. She talked with passion. Talked through the green, green tea ice cream about indigenous rights. About the fact she didn't like talking about autistic children. I don't like talking about work, she said. After dinner, we went to the red light district. Visited like good tourists, the, mu the living museum of women displayed in shop windows. Yawning, chatting, daydreaming, lost in thought. Always somewhere else. They were there, but they were not there. Perhaps for some people, an object became much more real than a person. Perhaps in their early days, objects were always there, comforting. But money, money was definitely a fetish. Could a fetishist love a shoe as much as some people love the smell of money? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Joanna Walsh. I'm also a writer and friend of Susanna's. And I am going to read one of the brev bravura bits because it's so good. Um, this is a bit where, where Nina has decided to, she's been reading feminist theory about Freud. And so she decides to go to the British Library to, to look some up. But first she decides to, to accept a gift from her new neighbor, Pearl. Thinking that all the articles that I was reading were part of this female vendetta, one of those strange days I smoked some of the skunk that Pearl had left on my table and then went to the British Library. I wondered whether it showed that I was out of orbit, but everybody was immersed in an atmosphere of sheer concentration. I ordered a few of those vicious and arid books populated by the Sisters of the Feminist Liberation Army and savoured all those female wrestlers engaged in a duel that perpetuated on the page a spree of atrocities. In the midst of the battle, I noticed machetes lurking between the volumes that went on upward to infinity. The female penis. 
I laughed out loud, receiving a few sideways glances from other readers. The image of a dominatrix with a strap-on penis flashed through my mind. I started giggling mentally at Sigmund F's universal concept of castration anxiety. I began to like the way it sounded. The way it compacted sex, violence and fear in a couple of words like a contemporary Hollywood blockbuster, a great Hollywood movie title. The way it condensed feared brutality and implied vulnerability. I thought of the elation that he must have experienced when conceiving the term. It was the kind of term that would seduce speculative minds. The term stretched itself in so many directions. It pointed to the fear of mutilation, the fear of loss of bodily integrity, a fear experienced in a minute way by anyone while cutting a difficult vegetable with a beautifully sharp knife. I should think that this fear must be universal, that fear of your body being brutally cut, except for those who are into self-mutilation. All those cultures where mutilation is part of belonging to a group like circumcision. And then, if he must have felt elated about the way castration anxiety sounded, the theory that he built around it allowed him to sublimate his own sadism. But it wasn't meant to be fiction, he was writing. He wasn't sad, articulating dark games from a luxurious prison. He was a lucid and brilliant horror writer who wanted to sound like a scientist putting forward his mad vision as the founding principle of human subjectivity. The British Library became a dissection room while I conjured up former lovers' one-night stands. It was a large but finite number. I conjured them up in search for concentration anxiety, but found no such thing. Au contraire, I found a surplus of eagerness and a sudden monomaniacal intensity in their dogged gaze, as if all their being was possessed by a single thought. I couldn't remember some faces, the color of some of my lover's eyes, but I remembered the zeal the occasional trembling, the humour, the gentle, the rough moments of orgasmic brutality, the unloyed sensitivity, the vertiginous dance. I then vaguely remembered an impotent guy who was having Lacanian therapy. But that was an exception. <laughs> Perhaps some individuals did experience castration anxiety but you could hardly hold it as a founding principle of human, human subjectivity. Separation anxiety would have sounded so limp in comparison. <laughs> the devil gets all the best tunes. To speak of a memorial to separation was to speak of the mother, that all-powerful presence of the mother. But girls had been deleted from the equation. After all, they didn't have what it took and that was what was at stake. I noticed that bleeding penises and vaginas were appearing on the British Library walls, hanging from the blue and golden dome like stalactites, as in a macabre film set. I decided to ignore it, but then I noticed for the first time the blue-eyed librarian's plaster on his index finger an indelible proof he had been bitten by a vag vagina dentata. I stared at the books on my desk, realizing for the first time the profound ugliness of all this writing spattered with maimed genitalia, real hatred, real violence coming from all sides, lavishly bespattered on the bookshelves. So much anger. I couldn't tune in with this type of anger. And yet somewhere I needed to solve this riddle. Somewhere I'd become infected by this highly contagious virus. Penis, penis, penis. Phallocentric order, 
phallicized women, phallic envy, penis envy, phallic economy of fetishism, phallic accessories, phallic men, phallic women, women as castrators, women as castrated, fathers as castrators, women, mothers as castrated, castrating mothers, castrating castration theories, where everybody became part of a monstrous chain that resulted in an abominable world of crushed sexualities. I entered the casualties unit of psychoanalytical fetishism. I wanted to find ideas that didn't depart from a fundamental violence. I read and read and read, and every page contained the word penis in numerable times, the word fallow in numerable times. I started coughing. I became choked, suffocated with so many penises. Undoubtedly, Sigmund F. had inoculated a virus into history, the penis virus. Undoubtedly, he had generated the longest deep throat in history. <laughs> subjugated sons and sisters to a seminal fellatio in the name of the lost father, the murdered father, a Jewish father who circumcised his sons. Sigmund F. had created a penis epidemic. I could see female snipers carrying submachine guns, shooting from all angles, reaching at climatic levels of apocalyptic heinousness. The floor was covered with fallen penises and inexistent vaginas. Blood spilling out of every gash. I left the library's angelic souls, its blue-eyed librarian with a plaster on his finger and the smell of warm human blood. As I went down, I noticed a few unburied penises rotting in the monumental staircase, flies buzzing over them. I went to Queen Mary's library and placed all the books I had been reading in the horror section, next to Lovecraft, and the biography of Nielsen. Um, thank you for coming. I'm very pleased you are all here. This was kind of organized really spontaneously with very little time. So I'm so pleased you are here. Uh, well, one thing on um, Joanna's uh, choice of, um, you know, a little bit of reading from my book. Uh, Lorna also wanted to read a little bit from there, The Penis Nightmare. And I just thought, God, my God, it's, you know, it's very intellectual. And then I realized it's really popular as well. <laughs> you know, The Penis Nightmare, they both wanted, they both overlapped in certain bits. So I thought that was quite funny because maybe for women the penis nightmare resonates, you know, big time. Um, with this chapter, with this chapter, it's interesting. I Google myself with, uh, you know, philosophical toys to Santa Medina to see whether there were any reviews. And it's really funny, there was this entry that said castration anxiety. And I just thought, well, it's, you know, internet bollocks. So I never clicked on it. <laughs> But at some point, I clicked on construction anxiety, and I, I have my own entry <laughs> from the novel. <laughs> it's so weird. I mean, it's like, it's from that chapter. Uh, you know, so that's the only entry that I have, and it's associated with castration anxiety, and I think it's great. You know, it's really good. Anyway, well, this is the book. Uh, you know, I'm very pleased that Lorna is here because she was, you know, very related to the book for a long time and, you know, I had an agent and she became my, my sub-agent because my agent wasn't doing anything. And we had some fantastic adventures with uh, the sub-agent stuff. Uh, really funny, funny things. And also Joanna, um, Joanna is a writer. She has a few novels coming out hotel and some other novels and she's created the ha this hashtag uh, in Twitter which is read women 2014 which has become read women and I think it's very interesting because uh, we've discovered there is a problem with uh, readers readers you know many readers many readers tend not to read female writers I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of exceptions, but there seems statistics, statistically, well, there's this hashtag, statistically, there are problems. So I think it's a great, great project. 
uh, you know, because he's pointing to, to an issue that is, is very important, it's a completely bizarre one in the 21st, 21st century, and, you know. Anyway, this book, Philosophical Toys, it went through many drafts. Uh, it's dedicated to my dad. There's a dad here that becomes ill, and then he dies. And then when I finish the first drafts, that's exactly what happened to my dad. So I leave the book twice. That was, you know, a big coincidence. Well, that was a fear maybe that I manifested when I wrote, you know, when I wrote the book, and then it happened. And another amazing, this is also another amazing coincidence, and somebody called it, you know, a message from the universe. Uh, is that in in this book there's uh, Nina's mother's shoe collection. She she kind of inherits it, and the shoe collection starts traveling. He goes to different shows. He starts traveling like shoes do, and in a way, the shoes are, are a metaphor for the back. You know, um, for our parents, the kind of uh, baggage we carry from our parents. So, it's, it's, if you look at that image with the shoe boxes, that was what I was, what it was about, about this kind of baggage that we carry, and. Um, so the shoes, the shoe collection starts traveling and it, it ends up on loan at the V&A Museum. It so happens that when the boxes, when the books arrived, uh, they arrived on the 10th of June. I've written a piece about it. Uh, you know, I was in my flat, it was like I kind of dropped time, blah, blah, blah. The books arrive, I feel, oh my God, I have to stop promoting you know, self-promoting. Uh, and what's amazing is that I wasn't going into social media at all. And then I went into Facebook and I saw a picture of, of a pair of shoes, uh, Rosie Goldsmith, who I, who I work with at a Best European Fiction event. And, uh, and he said, you know, shoe show at the V&A. And it was such an amazing coincidence that you know, the shoes, the shoe collection here ends up at the V&A. And then, you know, that day there was a shoe show there and, and I didn't have an invite or anything. I was just at home, you know, look, wearing really crappy clothes and, you know, going <laughs> and then I just like, you know, morphed into something else and went to the show without an invite and, you know, got in. And it was like walking around parts of my novel. And that was, it was so magical, it was amazing, I was so excited because like, you know, my novel was there at the V&A. Uh, I just think it's one of these coincidences that, you know, the shoe show is at the V&A at the moment, it's, it's an interesting show. I mean, for me, it was particularly interesting because I wrote about it <laughs> and then it was there. So, you know, a few things to do with, with with weird things that happen, uh, and this last one was like really exciting. Right, I'm going to read a, a few little bits. I'm going to read the first paragraph from the novel. I hope you get to fill in the gaps of the other bits that I won't be reading. Uh, it's always difficult to choose excerpts, I find, because, you know, there are so many. Uh, you have to choose some. Okay, this is the first paragraph. Uh, the first chapter is called The Sex Appeal of the Inorganic. Nina. My name is Nina. The same as my mother's. It comes from the Italian, from Aunt Nina. But in Catalan, Nina means doll. But it's not only my name. I talk of small things because they have been a recurring cipher at the center of my life. Also, those years, the years I'm writing about, toys had become ubiquitous. My friends kept giving me small toys as presents, kitsch gadgets, 
playful objects. I gave them similar trinkets. And then I felt, I started to sense, that these trashy toys were relevant players in the hypnotic ritual of post-industrial life. That's what I said to Chris one Sunday afternoon when we were caught up in a traffic jam of serving passers-by sucking lollipops while building the free toy from a chocolate kinder egg. These small polymer things, these trashy trinkets, there's a kind of spell in them, I said. My father used to call them Hong Kong rubbish, Chris said. Then, a fragile adolescent running on stilettos crossed the street majestically. You have to continue reading there. <laughs> The other bits, it's just so many bits. And this is much, much later in the novel. She's got some kind of um, ghost writing assignment. Uh, the, she's met a collector, and the collector has given, me, ga, given her a ghost writing assignment, and he's paid her already. She doesn't know whether she can do the job, but she's got the money. Uh, so she's got the money, and she goes out and spends it. So it's called The Money Kindergarten. The orgasmic green, the sheer intensity of the green of the grass. Perhaps it was money that made me aware of the orgasmic green, that made me see everything as more luminous on my return. Everything became sharper, more focused. And as I walked along the high streets with my new acquisitive power, I began to see the mesmerizing power of fetishism everywhere. Fetishism was a social phenomenon so ubiquitous that it had become invisible. I began to see the energy that emanated from certain objects, from the names of certain labels. It was obvious that la labels were fetishized names, but I realized for the first time the euphoria of objects, the glittering celebrity status. Some objects, some labels, were known by millions of people inhabiting the same media as our most cherished or despised stars appearing gracefully on television, in well-lit shots, in magazines, on billboards, photogenically looking at you, seducing you through slick sophistication, through humor even through a no-nonsense strategy that appealed to pragmatic minds. I realized that sometimes I wasn't sure whether I was looking at a thing or at the image of a thing instilled in my head through the endless loop of glossy repetition. I looked at all these people carrying plastics, plastic bags full of redemptive objects a collective ritualized excess that temporarily put them in direct contact with the Supreme. Dresses for the girls, gadgets for the boys, induced tangible reveries that catered to all sorts of palettes. I looked at men with the bags full of prosthetic gadgets, the dire appearance sometimes cancelled out by the glamorous fast cars. I looked at the playful appearance of women with their bags full of libidinal dreams. Inorganic seduction concealed the mechanic beat of the factory. An inaudible song, a song beyond human hearing frequencies. I tried to listen to the factory beat, see the invisible hands that assembled these objects the invisible movements and reveries 
that assembled everything in the world. It was possible to hear, to see it, but it gravitated towards the imperceptible. I realized that there were no trumps or drunks in the streets anymore. Or if there were, they were not all that eye-catching anymore. All the attention was absorbed by the sex appeal of the inorganic. There were only so many things your brain could focus on at a time. Perhaps whole continents had also been submerged by the emergence of this new gaze. Money, such an abstraction. Money could become anything. It could become time. It could become space. My kind of money could become a present for Mary Jane, a visit to my father, a red leather jacket, music, books, lipsticks, a sumptuous dinner with a sumptuous tip, a beautiful dress, a cheap car, a short rest from worrying about money. I had to pulverize all this money, materialize it, transform it into visible things. And then he goes on and on. Multitudes with shopping bags reenacting some ancient ritual of excess. I was part of it. I belonged. That's Okay. okay, thank you. And then there's another little bit here, jumping also several, you know, uh, many, many pages towards kind of the beginning of the end. And it's called, I, I posted it, well, I posted an excerpt that 3A Magazine published. Um, I posted it in Facebook, and it's because somebody, I don't know why I chose this for 3 a.m., but there you go. Uh, and I'm just going to read the first paragraph. It's called, oh, actually, there's some pages missing. That's all, I'm sure that's all right. I mean, I've had something else, but it's missing. There was something else called the object hyperballad, which is about objects, and I think maybe I left it at home. Which is fine. I mean, you can read it. It's called Object Hyperbola. I mean, you, if you get to read the book, which is good. Oh, okay. I'll do a video and I'll post it on the internet, and then you can listen to it if you don't if you don't want to read the book. Uh, somehow it's funny. I left it at home. There you go. There you go. Well, it saves us time. Okay. Uh, remember Object Hyperbola. You know, you missed it. You know, you remember it, yes? Okay. Uh, this is <laughs> the cloning passion, a sort of footnote. And it's towards, uh, towards the beginning of the end of the book. In this no place where there were no certain answers, where possible realities hovered, suspended, in opposition to brutal certainties. Life continued. Chris got less and less work as time went by, contradicting the idea of the future as progress. While I wrote less and less as scribbling forces garbed my energy. Time is a bastard, we have to face up to it. We have to annihilate it, he said. We looked at time intensely in the face until it withdrew into the background. It was the only thing we could do. Time made impossible contortions in self-defense. We blanked it. We turned our backs to it until it vanished. We put our feet on its gnarly torso, claiming an illusory victory, designed to keep our minds at rest. 
We obliterated time until we, we became time. We built a cocoon against time. We had sex day and night, we worked day and night. Chris took dazzling pictures of shadows and related phenomena. And I wound up rescuing the red notebook and started scribbling some of these pages. Time whizzed by in a flash. We just killed, we just killed time before he killed us. Okay, that's it. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll do the film, you know, when you're ready or when we feel all well. All of we are ready. Great. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. That's wonderful. <laughs> so funny, I forgot some patients. Yeah, oh, that's very strange. Well, there you go, that's fine. Let's do it. That's great, well done. Yeah. How do you feel? That was good. Right, that's okay. really good. It's good that, you know. Uh, Isabel! He had my mother here, and now she's eating. 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 She's